Good afternoon. Today I'm going to be reviewing the San Martin SN004G Limited Edition. This watch is available from watchdives.com for $239. US You can use the discount code WR4K to get $10 US discount off any watch over $150 US on watchdives.com. So firstly, let's look at the box that the watch comes in, and then I'll talk you through the other items one gets with the piece. So as this is a limited edition produced exclusively for watchdives.com, it comes in a watchdives branded plastic pelican style case rather than the San Martin watch box. I'll show the interior. As you can see, both halves are lined with two foam panels, which does a good job of protecting the watch and shipping. I like this black plastic pelican style case. They're very durable and practical, and they make a refreshing change from the default option of using a cardboard watch box. One also gets this San Martin Owner's Instruction Manual, clear concise diagrams, the instructions are in English, and it details the operation of the movement use, which is the Seiko NH35A Automatic. One also gets this plastic guarantee card. Now usually San Martin watches are covered by a 12 month international warranty. However, this watch being supplied by watchdives.com is covered by a two year international warranty. So one is getting an additional 12 months of cover, which is very good. One also gets this stainless steel spring bar tool, push pin at one end and a two prong fork at the other. No shank to this spring bar tool, solid stainless steel, finished to a good standard. And lastly, one also gets this stainless steel 1.6mm flat head screwdriver. Again, no shank to the body, finished to a good standard. Nice to get this included with the watch. So, with regards to the specifications of the piece, this is the San Martin SN004G Limited Edition. The watch is clearly an homage to the Tudor Black Bay 58, a watch I have previously reviewed. Now, there are certain differences between this limited edition version and the standard 004. We have a red triangle around the loom pip on the ceramic bezel insert, and the San Martin hex emblem is printed in gilt on the dial rather than being an applied hex in gilt. And I think they are both enhancements. I like the red triangle, which contrasts very well, and I like the printed gilt hex logo as opposed to the applied gilt hex. So with regards to the dimensions, we have a 38.5 millimeter case diameter. We have a lug to lug measurement of 46 millimeters, a thickness of 13.3 millimeters, and a lug width of 20 millimeters. The oyster style bracelet tapers from 20 millimeters at the lugs down to 16 millimeters at the two button push clasp. The two button push clasp is signed to high standard with an embossed San Martin hex, as you can see. I like the firm resistance of the two button push triggers. Now, I'm often critical of brands only having two or three micro adjustment holes in their clasp. San Martin have made the correct decision by having four micro adjustment holes because that means one can fine tune the length of the bracelet to get the perfect fit. Flawless mirror polishing to the large bevels machined to the edges to the clasp and beautiful luster to the 316L grade stainless steel brass satin finishing. Absolutely finished to perfection, no sharp edges, no burrs. The San Martin two button push clasp is one of my favorite clasps. I absolutely love it. So I like the firm resistance to the two button push triggers as I've discussed. Beautiful luster to the brass satin finishing to the solid 316L grade stainless steel solid mill clasp interior as you can see. Nice positive click when one closes it which is very reassuring. With regards to the rest of the specification, we have a double dome sapphire crystal with blue tinted anti-reflective coating on the underside. When I tilt the piece at an oblique angle, you can see the blue tinted AR coating does an excellent job of reducing the glare and the highly reflective nature of the mirror polished gilt applied indices and mirror polished gilt snowflake hands. These snowflake hands are very well proportioned. The minute hand extends all the way to the minute ticks on the chapter ring, as does the snowflake second hand. It also extends fully to the minute ticks. This is something I want to give due credit to San Martin for because often Ch uh, Chinese brands within the low tier, they make the mistake of undersizing the hands. They're too small and under proportions and they're too short. Often the minute hand and the second hand doesn't reach the minute ticks on the chaptering, but the proportions of these snowflake hands are perfect and they do a good job of being an homage to the Tudor snowflake hands used on the Black Bay 58. I like the symmetry of the dial. It follows the classic Submariner or Black Bay dial layout. Perfect symmetry to it with the rectangle indices at 9, 6 and 3. And it really is very legible and the gilt minute ticks on the chaptering also contrasts very well against the matte black dial. 
Now, it's subjective with regards to the emblem. Some collectors like the gilt applied in this uh, hex logo. I personally like the gilt printed logo because on this limited edition, it contrasts very well with the matte dial and also complements the gilt text at six o'clock and the gilt minute ticks. One thing I like about San Martin dials is they don't overbrand the watch with unnecessary text or specification. We simply have just the right amount of information. The San Martin hex emblem at 12 and then automatic 200 meters equals 660 feet at six o'clock. So just the perfect dial layout. It really is an example to other brands of how to get it correct. So with regards to the bezel, we have a ceramic bezel insert, which is inlaid with gilt paint and that contrasts very well with the red triangle. And they've done a very good job of the engraving to the ceramic and also the infilling of the minute ticks in the first quarter. So the, the bezel is solid 316L grade stainless steel, gear tooth profile to it. The gear tooth profiling is mirror polished and the inside of the teeth are matte bead blasted effects. So they've done a very good job of the uh, bezel. 120 click unidirectional bezel as one would expect. So let's test the bezel action. Nice, loud, audible clicks. It feels even all the way through the 360 degrees rotation. I described the resistance of the 120 clicks as being medium, lighter than a Steinhardt Ocean 139, and very similar to a Seiko bezel action, if you're familiar with the 5KX or the SKX007. It's got that kind of medium resistance to it, which I actually like. No lateral side-side -side play whatsoever. No back play whatsoever, nice tight bezel execution. Just very well balanced because it's got medium resistance. It doesn't feel too light or too loose. It feels smooth all the way through the 360 degrees, but it's still tight enough not to have any lateral side side play or any back play. So I'll just check the alignment. The loom pip and triangle aligned perfectly at 12 o'clock with the 12 o'clock index on the dial. So this is an example of two other brands of how to get the bezel execution perfect. 10 out of 10 bezel execution. With regards to the crown, it's solid 316L grade stainless steel, no old finish, mirror polished domed cap to it with the San Martin embossed S emblem. Now, personally, I prefer if they had used the hex emblem because that would be, give continuity of design because we'd have the gilt printed hex emblem on the dial and the embossed hex on the clasp matching the hex emblem on the crown. This S looks like a US dollar symbol. Now, it is sub subjective. Some collectors like it, but personally, I think the hex emblem on the crown is better looking. It's more aesthetically pleasing, and I prefer the continuity of having the hex in the three aforementioned positions. So I would like to see San Martin change this S uh, emblem crown to the hex version. I think it would enhance the piece. With regards to the finishing, I like the large mirror polished bevels to the edge of the case, which mark the transition between the tops of the lugs, which are brass satin finish, and the flanks to the case, which are brass satin finish to a flawless standard, beautiful luster to the 316L grade stainless steel, as you can see. <coughs> Excuse me. In terms of case finishing, it's not far off for Black Bay 58, and this is something I want to give due credit to San Martin for. No sharp edges, no burrs to the undercut of the case. The mirror polishing to the bevels is absolutely flawless and the brass satin finishing is also absolutely flawless. It's very fine. One can see the grain of the 316L grade stainless steel with a longitudinal brass satin finishing. The luster is absolutely gorgeous. And this is the kind of case finishing one would expect to see on a mid-tier piece such as the Black Bay 58, a circa 3,000 euro piece. To get this at only 239 US dollars is very impressive. I'll show you the case back. Solid 316L grade stainless steel. One can see the concentric CNC lathe tool machining, and I like the way the concentric machining refracts the light. It's sterile as per a Tudor Black Bay 58, uh, which does have some engraving on it, but the center section of the Black Bay 58 case backs are sterile as per Rolex. Now the benefit of it being perfectly flat is it's very low profile, sits snug against the wrist and it's very smooth and comfortable to wear the piece for long periods of time with no engravings. So I think they've made the correct decision by using a sterile case back rather than engraving the emblem or alternative to the specification as per other brands. And the female pivoted end links are a good tight fit to the case. Flawless finishing to the underside to the head of the piece and the finishing to the female pivoted end links is also excellent. 
So let's test the screw down crown execution. Nailed finish, as you can see, and as I've discussed, it's embossed with the S. Let's test the action. Absolutely silky smooth. Nice firm resistance to the threading, but that's due to the friction of the rubber O-ring inside the stainless steel crown and the second rubber O-ring inside the stainless steel crown tube. But the interface between the external thread of the stainless steel crown and the internal thread of the stainless steel crown itself are very good. The crown tube and the crown interface very well. Silky smooth. Now this has the NH35A. I personally would have preferred them to use the NH38 because that would have deleted the date complication. The negative of the NH35A is that one does have a phantom date setting position. In the first click position, it has a phantom setting position. Now, and when one rotates the crown anti-clockwise, one can feel the quick set complication working. The date wheel is present underneath the dial. One can feel the date clicking over. Within an H38, there is only one click on the crown, and that's better. So pulling it out to the second click position hacks the movement. If you look at the snowflake hand, you can see it's now stopped dead. It's possible to hack the movement to set the time precisely to the second. Nice firm resistance to the NH35A, which is something I like about it. No back play, clockwise or anti-clockwise. One can feel the friction of the gears in the movement, but I like the fact it feels like a good, solid, tight movement. Pushing it back in, it's got a nice positive click, and that restarts the second hand, as you can see. So let's test screwing it back down. Immediate thread pickup. This is outstanding screw down crown execution, something that San Martin do very well and they deserve full credit for. Their screw down crowns are silky smooth and they really do feel quite similar to a Tudor screw down crown, uh, alternatively a Rolex trip lock crown, which are the very best. I really like the feeling of it. Now, there is an, a firm resistance to it because the NH35A does have a spring load in action to the winding stem when fully wound. Absolute pleasure to screw it down. The screw down crown provides an effective hermetic seal to 200 meters, which is perfectly acceptable. So I'll give you a wrist shot and you can see how it fits on my eight inch wrist. Now I haven't sized the bracelet, so I've simply taken the watch out of the watch box and I'm pleased to report it fits my eight inch wrist perfectly without resizing. As you know from my previous reviews, I like to size my bracelets loose so I can always fit an index finger underneath the bracelet and clasp at all times. This is the correct sizing method because it allows for wrist expansion in warmer weather or when one is active. So beautiful luster to the clasp. The taper to the Oyster Star bracelet is perfection personified. 20 millimeters down to 16 is the perfect taper for an Oyster Star bracelet. One detail I really like about this limited edition is we have female pivoted end links. Early versions, the V1004 had male end links and a rivet link bracelet but I like the female pivoted end links because they pull the end link of the bracelet closer to the wrist for a snug fit. And particularly if you're a collector with a smaller wrist of six to seven inches, you'll really enjoy the enhancement of the female pivoted end link because it means that it gives a nice tight fit to the wrist. The proportions to this watch are very good. The head of the piece is 38.5. So I would say it's best suited to collectors with a smaller wrist of six to seven inches. 46 millimeter lug to lug measurement is relatively short. As you'll know from my previous reviews, I consider 48 to be the sweet spot. 46 is under that, so really it's best suited to collectors with a smaller wrist rather than collectors with a seven to eight inch wrist. I really think that this gives a very good fit. It's very snug to the wrist, very low profile, and it's only 13.3 millimeters tall, including the double dome sapphire crystal. So it's easily going to slip underneath a shirt cuff if you wear business shirts. 144 grams, which is very good, gives a nice feeling of wrist presence and quality. But I regard circa 150 grams to be the sweet spot because it means that the piece doesn't feel top heavy. It feels balanced and therefore comfortable to wear for long periods of time, such as 8 to 12 hours per day. So at 144, it feels very well balanced. And they've made the correct decision by using a 20 millimeter lug width on the 38.5 millimeter head of the piece. The proportions really are outstanding and 13.3 is a nice thickness. Right, so let's do a loom test and we'll see how the loom performs when it's charged up to the absolute maximum. So as always, I'm going to use my 100 UV LED torch to charge it up to the absolute peak. Right, so that's now fully charged and as you can see, it has not disappointed. 
This is clearly C3 Superluminova and it's 10 out of 10 top grade Superluminova. C3 is one of my personal favourites because I like the characteristic green tone of it. Nice colour match with the green tone of the Loom Pip on the ceramic bezel insert, the applied indices and also the snowflake hands. One of the benefits of using snowflake hands is the large area of Loom plots. One can apply five to six layers of Superluminova. There's a larger surface area than using Mercedes hands and therefore they are better in terms of legibility. The Loom is glowing incredibly brightly and it will continue to glow for a good length of time as one would expect with top grade C3 Superluminova. In terms of performance, I really don't think there's any difference between the Luminova, the Superluminova used on this piece and the Superluminova used on the Black Bay 58, which this is an homage to. It's equal in quality to Rolex Chromalite or alternatively Seiko Lumabrite, which are the very best Superluminovas used in the watch industry. So as you can see, glowing incredibly brightly. The legibility is outstanding. The symmetry of the dial is perfection personified. I love the Black Bay 58 dial layouts. It really is very legible. And the absence of a date complication means we have the perfect symmetry of the 9, 6 and 3 rectangle indices on the dial. So this is an example to other brands of how to get it correct. Right, so let's discuss the movement used. You'll all be familiar with the Seiko NH35A automatic. It's a reliable, well-proven workhorse movement. It has 24 joules and it runs at 21,600 vibrations per hour and a frequency of 3 hertz. It has hand winding and hacking, which is useful complications. 40 hour power reserve is perfectly acceptable. The stated accuracy of the NH35A automatic is minus 20 to plus 40 seconds per day. So a rather wide accuracy range. However, I'm pleased to report that San Martin are well regulating the NH35A they are using. This one is running consistently at plus 6 seconds per day, which is well within the minus 20 to plus 40 per day stated accuracy. Plus 6 is excellent. It's actually within COSC chronometer limits. So I think they deserve full credit to regulate an NH35A to plus 6. Really is very impressive. And I think it's the correct choice of movement for this. San Martin are currently using two movements for the 004, the Epson Caliber YN55A and also the Seiko NH35A. Really it's subjective, uh, some collectors prefer the NH35A, uh, some collectors prefer the YN55A. The YN55A is a credible alternative, it's the same as the Epson Caliber F6922 which is used in several Orient watches such as the Kamasu. Personally, I prefer the NH35A. It's a reliable, well-proven workhorse movement. And I really like the fact it's got hand winding and hacking, which are useful complications. But however, I personally would have preferred to see the NH38 used because that deletes the date complication. The architecture of the 38 is the same as the 35A. It just doesn't have the date complication and that would delete the additional phantom setting uh, date position on the crown. But however, the NH35A is the correct choice, and I think it doesn't matter if one gets a 004 with the YN55A or the NH35A. They're both equal in quality. Quality control builds quality and materials. So this one uses the NH35A, and as I've demonstrated, it has that phantom date setting position. But I like the reliability of it, and plus six is excellent accuracy. So lastly, I'll summarize the piece. What do I think of it overall? Well, when I'm considering reviewing a watch on my channel, the watch will meet two criteria. It should be both excellent quality and excellent value at the respective price point. So US$239 is the price point. Really, to evaluate this piece, one has to study the quality of the finishing throughout. Looking at the bracelet, the quality of the female pivoted end links is perfection personified. Very close to a Black Bay 58's female pivoted end links in terms of the smoothness. Nice tight fit to the head of the piece. Flawless mirror polishing to the flanks, I like the use of screw pins rather than push pins. Beautiful lustre to the 316L grade stainless steel oyster style bracelet. So the quality of the finishing to the head of the piece, including the bezel, the head and the case back are all 10 out of 10. The finishing to the bracelet is 10 out of 10. The finishing to the clasp is 10 out of 10. No quality control issues whatsoever, no finishing defects whatsoever. This is the kind of finishing one would expect on a Black Bay 58 costing circa €3,000. So really, that is the level of finishing we're looking at. 
So yes, I'm going to declare it excellent quality and yes, I'm going to declare it excellent value at 239 US dollars. This is one of the greatest San Martin watches ever made. The only negative, the only thing I would change is change the S signed crown to a San Martin hex crown. Other than that, this is the perfect watch. So I'm going to highly recommend it to you for consideration. I'm going to declare it a champagne watch for lemonade money. I hope you've enjoyed my review of the San Martin SN004G limited edition. Please feel free to post your own comments below the video. Thank you very much.